Now we have Eric Weinberg from Nielsen Entertainment. Great. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Eric Weinberg, uh, president of Nielsen Entertainment. And for the music industry, that means I oversee uh, SoundScan, which I guess in this audience can be both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's our first year here, and we're, we're very pleased to be here. The independent music uh, scene is, is critical to what we do, and it's critical to the future of the industry. The vibrancy that you bring here uh, is going to keep us going for, for some time. Uh, I think it's been clear from all these discussions that we're at an incredibly exciting and though at the same time stressful stage of the, the music industry. There's a period of enormous transition um, and a lot of experimentation. And that's going to create both opportunities for everybody and it's also going to be quite honestly difficult uh, for the next couple of years. Before I get into the presentation, I just want to really quickly talk about why is it so important that we track what's going on. Why does SoundScan matter into the industry? What are the other um, aspects that we're trying to capture? Why are they so important? We firmly believe that to provide a neutral, though reliable source of what's happening in the industry is vital so that people know what's succeeding and what is not succeeding. And it helps us help the labels, help the indies, help the artists, help the agents, you name it, better understand where they should focus their efforts, what's working, and what's not working. And it also shines a light into what's really happening in the industry. You're going to hear a lot, you know, there's a lot of stories out there about what's happening, a lot of anecdotal information, but we believe that rich, accurate data is essential for getting a true gauge on the industry. And I just want to bring one example up from way back when, 20 years ago, when I probably had more of a full head of hair, and I assume a lot of you did as well. When SoundScan started, the charts used to be put together by Billboard, and they would call up record stores, primarily on the East Coast and the West Coast, to figure out what was happening. And you got a chart that was very skewed towards those centers of activity. When SoundScan came along and took a comprehensive view of the industry, it showed what was really happening in the industry. And for instance, the charts 20 years ago never showcased the importance of country music. And they never highlighted the importance of rap music. And those were two enormous areas of activity that really grew over the past 20 years. And when people understood what was actually happening, when people understood what the consumer was actually interested in, it led to increased investment in country music and led to increased investment in rap music. And at the same time, investment in other forms of music back then didn't diminish. So it's our view that by shining a light on what's happening, we can increase the overall pie of investment that's going towards the music industry. So let me walk you briefly through what we do and where we want to take the business. Our core business in the U.S. is SoundScan, which is tracking sales information that's used in the billboard charts and is used by a wide range of music constituents. What we're doing there is we're tracking both physical sales from 25,000 retailers across the U.S., as well as digital sales, both digital albums and digital singles. We believe that on the physical side, we track sales directly from around 97% of retailers out there, and on the digital side, we're tracking around 99% of legitimate paid transactions. We've also extended this service to Europe so that we're tracking music downloads in Europe, Australia, and Asia. Next page. Our other core business on the music side is performance monitoring. So we're tracking what's being played on radio, what's being played on music television, and though not mentioned here, it's something we've been working extensively on recently, what's happening in streaming activity. Uh, we're tracking both um, music streaming as well as music video streaming. We see this an area of continued growth and you know, we're actively seeking to work with data partners who can help us in this area. Next page. I think this is an important slide. It's just a representative sample of, of who uses our data. And, and I want to make a couple of points because I'm somewhat new to this as well. I've only been at this for uh, a little under a year, and that's part of the reason we're here for the first time. We want to make sure that our data is accessible throughout the industry. We don't want to be seen as a tool for simply the labels or the indies. 
It's our view that if people aren't using our information, our information is being wasted. So for the independents out there, you know, we're very open these days, and I don't think we've always been this way, to coming up with strategies and, and pricing policies so that you can use our information. We never want to be in a situation where it's inaccessible to you. So whether it's a, working as a group or you have individual queries, come in and talk to us, because I firmly believe that the independent musicians of today are going to be, if they want, the superstars of tomorrow. And it's very important that we provide them with the same access to information so that they can manage their careers that we're providing to the major labels and the major agencies out there. So what's our approach to the future? And, and people ask me, what is the music industry going to look like in a couple of years? I tell them honestly, I've got no friggin' idea. Um, I don't think anyone can accurately say what the industry is going to look at in two years. I think there's going to be an enormous amount of experimentation. Some models are going to work. Some models aren't going to work. Uh, on top of that, what's going to work for one artist may not work for another artist. So it's this period of great experimentation where I think one thing is true, and we talked about this, uh, some of the other presenters talked about this, despite the headline figures of sales declining, music consumption continues to grow and is at an all-time high. People love music. It's one of the things that's so fantastic about working in this industry is the passion of the fans, the passion of the performers. You don't get this same type of passion when you're dealing with toothpaste or other types of products. It's really fantastic. That's not going to go away. The secret for all of us, the challenge for all of us, is how do we experiment and how do we use the information which is out there, at least from our perspective, to understand what's actually driving revenue. And this is a big point and one that I think is, is vital uh, to keep in mind. Um, there's going to be traditional metrics of, of revenue, and that's going to be physical sales, digital sales, that's going to be airplay, and to some extent streaming. And there are going to be new consumption measurements, which are some are out there. That could be social media, that could be other things which are evolving. We want to use that information to work with our clients to understand what does it all mean. Our view is that we're entering a world of increased complexity. And one of the things that we want to do is work with the industry to simplify everything that's out there and make sure that we're focusing on the areas of the industry which are actionable and are actually driving revenue for you. Next page. And what does that mean? It means wherever music is going, we want to go with that. And we want to be there to track what's happening, track the consumption, and track the activity. So that's on the web, that's at live shows, that's on TV, and that's merchandising. It's very important for us to take a view that where SoundScan in the past was very focused on transactions of a particular song or a particular album, we want to be able to get a more comprehensive view of what's happening to an artist. What is overall artist activity? Because how you define success these days is much broader than it's ever been. And while we believe the charts will continue to remain important, you know, there's more than one way of being successful in this new environment. So how are we going to go about doing this? I think like everyone else, you know, it's a world with limited resources. And there's lots of opportunities for distributing your music. There's lots of opportunities for gauging how your fans are interacting with you. We at Nielsen, we at SoundScan firmly believe that we can't do this all on our own. So we want to talk to people in the industry who are sitting on data that may be important to us. So that includes working with other digital providers. It involves working with market innovators, companies that have an understanding of what's happening with the consumer, what is their behavior. And we want to bring it all together in a way that makes sense for all of you. I think we can, next page is more illustrative. We can put that up. It's not really an eye chart, though it seems that way. You know, this is just something we drew up. You can't even read it, but we can send it out to anybody. It's a way of looking at what is an artist doing. And this is kind of going back to the point that we believe in supporting the industry. We believe that there is an enormous amount of activity out there. And again, if people only focus on the decline in sales, they're going to miss all the activity that's occurring. And what this looks at, you can't really read it, that is to take an artist, look at the, the wealth of, of activity that goes around with that. That could include 
physical sales, digital sales, radio airplay, streaming activity, internet buzz, music video on the web. It can include live tickets. It can include merchandising. And what it shows is that this is a really vibrant industry. And again, I kind of go back to the fundamentals. The more vibrant that this industry is, the more people are willing to invest in this industry, the better off the musicians and the artists will be. And I think that we need to showcase that music is evolving, but it's moving towards a place where there is a constant demand and a constant need for innovative artists to fill the void. So just to conclude, you know, it's a real changing environment, a lot of experimentation going on. I think like most of you realize we can't do it alone. And we're trying to figure out what are the sources of data in this complex world which we can really use to help drive revenue. And if you have suggestions, you have ideas, come talk to us because, you know, again, I'm probably, you know what it's like out there. We know that we can't do it alone. We want to work with artists of all shapes and sizes to really figure out what the future of music really is. Thank you. Okay, let's have a conversation, shall we? Um, one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of right off the bat, uh, I don't think Justin Bieber or Lady Gaga are in the audience. The lights are kind of bright. Um, but I, wa I want you guys to, to tell me maybe, like, did anything that you saw in any of these presentations make sense for mere mortal musicians? And we can maybe start with Rebecca and just go right through. Did it make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, it made what sense. What made sense? Um, what did make sense? Whether it was applicable to someone who is a, a working artist, that's, I mean, I'll be straightforward. Like, I, I, I was uh, in a label, indie label context and released three records with Sub Pop. I quit playing and just sort of sang on other people's records, and then I'm finishing up my own record, so I'm basically the classic solo entrepreneur and I am slowly looking at how to build that next phase of, of how I'm attaching things. So a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of this is, doesn't really, it feels applicable. It feels like there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of interesting tools. And it's just a matter of sorting through what is effective. What helps you sort through? And, and was there anything that you saw that you said, yes, I need this, or no, this doesn't really mean anything to me? Well, I think that one of the things that I'm dealing with and, and that's interesting to me is in terms of digital media and the future of music is what is actually serving an artist, what's serving engineers, what's serving a community of creators. So a lot of this, uh, I, my perception just right off the bat is that a lot of this is really, are really great promo tools. So if I get to a point where I have a record, I have it funded, I have it manufactured and distributed, then I have this, these, all these options for promoting and for expanding my audience. I've never really been convinced of social media and I'm not really involved in any of the analytics and like haven't really gathered that data that having a million hits has sold a lot of records or provide a lot of You are a Twitter income. maestro, though. You, you rule, you rule <laughs> yeah, Twitter. Yeah, but I'm not on Facebook. Facebook. You know, I mean, I'm also, there's a lot of me that, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of, I'm very persnickety as far as my interfaces go. So I'm excited by the idea of, of, of open source. I'm excited by the idea of tools being available to artists and having them be affordable and having them be real world based. Do you think musicians have the luxury of being persnickety or should they just get go all in? Well, that's our job. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, to some of us, obviously, there's a lot of different ways of promoting, but I think that, or if, I mean, of operating, but I mean, I mean, one of the things that I think, the, well, I'm going to stop, I, you don't want me to, to get me started, because I've got a lot that I've thought about, but I think in terms of, there's a lot of interesting options here, and I think it's, it's great if people like Nielsen and every, I mean, I like the idea of like these options being available to artists whether they're actually things that as a persnickety artist that is interested in making things I am ready to dive into and get really excited about right now. It's, I'm more interested in actual like nuts and bolts. Gotcha. Hey Dick, you work with persnickety artists all the time, right? Um, what, what do you think is, uh, is meaningful about what you saw today and, and, and what might need to be tweaked? Um, you know, because you, you deal with these persnickety artists, you know what they need. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, great. Well, 
Can everybody hear me? All right, I'm going to put my book up here so I can read from my notes. So I heard a lot of really interesting things from all the panelists, um, and I have a lot of questions, um, different questions for each panelist. I'll dump a couple of them out uh, for each one of them. First of all, you know, my, my overall feeling about the, the Facebook platform in general, I'll just go in the order that you, that you presented, um, is that it's, it's a great base. Um, the musicians that I speak with on a daily basis um, uh, invariably ask me how they can maximize their Facebook presence. And I think Facebook would benefit from um, a clearer message for musicians on how to, face, how to maximize your Facebook presence. I, I heard what you said about um, facebook.com slash, slash influence, uh, influencers. And that's interesting to me. Um, but uh, the kinds of things that I think artists need to uh, focus on is, for instance, how to use lists properly. Maybe a discussion of how to use lists properly. There's such a, an overload of information on Facebook. Um, you know, four years ago or three years ago, Facebook, I read every message that came in, um, you know, in terms of a notification. And now I end up having delete, uh, to delete an awful lot of them that aren't really applicable to me. Um, uh, people use their email to, or their uh, Facebook email to hit me with a message that um, is for something happening in Toronto um, repeatedly. And that makes me want to unsubscribe from it. So I think that's, that's a pretty important thing. Um, Facebook advertising is uh, also, I think, a really underutilized tool for artists. I think it's a brilliant tool for artists. Um, I, um, I, I encourage you to reach out to musicians um, more directly with information, more proactively maybe, um, rather than waiting for them to come to you. Um, and then the last thing on that is probably um, integrated sales of music. I know you guys were going to mention that, sorry for <laughs> <laughs> jumping the gun on that one. I could go for more, but I'll just start with that. So on the YouTube side of things, um, Let's see, where do I want to start here? Um, Bieber? <laughs> how about uh, splitting payments? I don't know whether that's possible on the YouTube uh, platform. If you can pay not only the music provider, but the person who filmed um, the event, whatever it is, you know, the, the JK wedding video. I don't know if that was just the music person that, owned, uh, that earned uh, revenue off that. But frequently, uh, uh, as in the music business, you have lots of people contributing to um, to the creation of a video, and, and they should all have some opportunity to be paid as well. I, I just want to jump in and say, that, and the publishers as well. I don't know how, how the publishers are actually involved in, in that, but you know, they should certainly be a part of the uh, process in terms of the approvals. I think it's easier to do that on the master recording side because there's uh, your, your content identification management system is great. It's a really cool thing, but you know, beyond that, how the writers and publishers get involved. Um, just maybe just two other general questions for you. Um, you mentioned the youtube.com slash musicians wanted. Um, don't know if that's where it talks about how you get a vanity URL. That's a question that comes up to me all the time. Um, and uh, let's see, what was the other thing I wanted to ask you about? Um, da, 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 da. I, uh, let me come back. I know there was one other question that I had for you, and I'm not seeing it on my page here. But You can um, just jump in after if you want. I'll jump in afterwards and get that one. Cash Music. I don't want to hog the mic for too long here. Cash Music. Um, Jesse, I think you should talk some more about direct-to-fan sales and about what your plans are um, in that area. Talk to me next week. <laughs> we're, um, we're actually debuting our um, direct-to-fan sales and open-source PayPal to download um, mechanism next week, and uh, we'll debut it, it's a lot more complicated than the little things we've done. So they're also, it's, it's just a preview release. We're uh, going to be working over the next um, th probably three to four, even five weeks to finish installers to make that more robust. But we are going to show it off um, either this week or next week, depending on when the artist releases it. Because to me, that's one of the real beauties of the Cash Music platform, is that it, it is all leading to an integrated uh, solution for, for commerce, which is also a question I have for the YouTube uh, love, love to have you talk so some more about I that think, too. I think maybe, um, yeah, talk, before they, uh, they are top of mind, on some of the things you've talked about, I think the idea of paying users is really interesting. 
And so if you look at YouTube as a platform, some of our best um, and most profitable people on the platform are YouTube original content creators. Right? And so we've started a program, YPP, which we recently extended to musicians. Now, I think you're talking about specifically in the mashup space, right? How, how do you involve the user in, in payment, right? And so it's a very interesting thing. And it's, it's nothing that we have any philosophical uh, opposition to. And actually what you've seen happen, and I think it's really interesting, we recently did a partnership with Rumblefish Music, which allows users to go and basically get blanket licenses for sound recordings and sync from, from Rumblefish so that the users can then go and participate and use this music. So we have use this music in their content that's monetized on YouTube. Right? So um, as everybody on this panel knows, the dual copyright and um, thousands of publishers in the US and collecting size internationally make this a, a very large problem. Some would say intractable, but we're making huge progress on solving it. Um, so we, we've already taken steps to, to enable the idea of having music on the platform, having users use music and still get paid for it on YouTube. Is the technology solving it or is it just a, an attitudinal change because people are recognizing how the market's evolving? It's two things. It's technology. One, it's, it's a huge data problem. So we're working on solving the data problem of who owns what and where and then identifying that content. And then it's, um, but that in and of itself doesn't solve anything, right? There's, there's the attitude shift that has to happen and is happening. We have deals with every major music label and publisher in the United States to include their content in user-generated video, and that's something that has happened in the last five years. None, none of the notion that that would have existed. Does that extend to uh, independence? You talked a little bit about that as well. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. And so, um, I mean, what is specifically what extent to I mean, one of the things that we've been uh, concerned about, or at least paying a lot of attention to over the years, is uh, you know when there's kind of a partnership or an equity situation with a major uh, platform mm -hmm. and the major rights holders. You know, it seems like the independent labels are often um, uh, invited to the party a little bit late. And then, of course, we're concerned as well about the artists who are now kind of uh, making a go, doing their own thing and building their own systems, yeah. and uh, whether or not those same uh, luxuries will be afforded so I think that community. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Some of our earliest partners and some of our most successful partners on the platform are actually independent labels. So the, on the scale of magnitude of the money we're sending to the independent com community, it's very, um, it's very in line with what we're sending to the majors. And also, YouTube's philosophy around all of this ecosystem is that it needs to be sustainable, and for it to be sustainable, it needs to be equitable. Mm -hmm. So if you, look at, if you look at how we approach independents and majors, we're looking at building something that's sustainable for us as a platform, but that rewards everybody in the community well. I'd love to hear uh, Meredith if she uh, wants to respond to anything that Dick said, if we can remember what Dick said. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for dumping it all out there at once. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think in terms of, I guess I'll talk about lists first. So pages actually don't have the list functionality. Um, they do have the ability to target by um, geography. So every time that you post something, um, in the publisher's like normal status update for a profile, um, you're able to target by um, a city or a, a country or something like that. So that's sort of solving the, the list problem that you're talking about. Um, but you're right, like you know, people have to be able to to filter in the appropriate way in order to make sure that they're getting the content that is actually most relevant to them. Um, Can I ask you a, just a quick follow up to that? Yeah. Do, do ads integrate with your Facebook friends? So, for instance, if I <laughs> create a context-sensitive ad, an ad for a city in Florida, mm -hmm. will the ad automatically serve to uh, the people that it should be reaching out to if I, if I choose to make it do that? That might be a nice addition. Yeah, meaning that if you, if you purchase an ad on Facebook and target it by the specific location, yeah, it will only go to the people in that only city. Only the people or, in that area. Yes, exactly. So let's say I wanted to create an ad that was specific for people in Seattle. Um, people that like the venue that I am playing at, people that like the type of music that I play, um, and you can basically get as granular as you possibly want to. Um, so let's say it, that's only reaching 500 people because it, you're just being so granular there. Um, that's a really quality 500 people that you're targeting because those are exactly the people that are probably going to come to your show. Something like so that. what we've learned is bands should not spam dick if they're outside <laughs> of a certain <laughs> region. Um, yeah, look, I, can I just jump in? Have I have a I want to, I want to hear from Emily in a second, though, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's interesting, and, you know, I've, I've used the targeting functionality uh, with Facebook advertising, and, and that part of it is great. 
But one, one of my questions is, is like, I see opportunities to spend money with Facebook. I'm, I'm looking for opportunities for artists to, to make money. This also goes uh, for YouTube in a little bit different context, but uh, you know, if you get to a point where you are uh, an artist or you know, really, really anyone that's getting a large number of people to, to the page, you guys are serving, I think in your image, you know, you had a, there was a Starbucks ad that came up on the page. Now, if I'm you know, you know, a huge artist or anyone who draws a significant amount of people to the page, mm -hmm. are you going to eventually have the opportunity for the people who are drawing the crowd to that page to participate in the revenue that you guys are currently generating from putting ads on those pages? Um, so I can't really speak to like the future of our ads model in that way, but I mean pretty much, um, it, that's an interesting concept of pretty much like if you're an artist that is is you, if you're the Lady Gaga's of the world and you have so many people generating that many page views for certain ads, um, then yeah. But I mean, like the ads are pretty much separate from that experience. Those are not, you're not um, targeting. So Starbucks in that situation had nothing to do with that screenshot at all. It, was, it just happened to be that um, Starbucks was targeting me or something. Um, so the experiences are separate, um, but I, I see your point of that could be an interesting, interesting thought. Um, but going to, um, uh, pretty much the artists making money from their Facebook pages and things like that. So ultimately we're an open platform and that the ex a lot of the experiences, a lot of the great pages um, have applications and things that are built by outside developers, things that are not built by us. We're really just there to kind of open our technology to people and for them to create and build new applications on top of us. So um, if an artist wants to build something where they um, have uh, the ability for people to purchase their music right from their Facebook page, um, even though that may not be an, a Facebook specific or Facebook core application, it's still an application built on top of our platform, and so they're able to kind of control that, um, control the the experience that they have when they uh, are asking their fans to purchase music. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely get that. I, I get that part of it. But you know, like I said, if you are, you do create, uh, for instance. Uh, or I, I work with these guys and we manage Drake's page, you know, so we get, a, I think we get a pretty significant amount of traffic. There's like six and a half million fans on it and I recognize, you know, he's, you know, one of the exceptions, but uh, just to have something integrated into it where we're participating in the revenue that's being generated currently, people are going to look at his page. I mean, I, I recognize that people are going to, uh, you know, to, to their own wall and looking at their feed. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, if you're like, okay, I want to see everything that's going on with this particular artist or this particular content creator, uh, you know, as you guys are generating revenue from it, and I understand you've got to get, you know, it doesn't make sense if someone gets a hundred page views. Right. You know, I get that you've got to, you know, you've got to reach some type of a critical mass before it. But I just think conceptually that uh, when a content provider it gets to the point where they are generating enough page views where it is a money maker for the platform itself mm -hmm. that the content provider should participate in the revenue that's being generated. Emily, uh, I'm <laughs> sorry, uh, a per penny, a per penny royalty uh, rate for your thoughts, please. Um, I love Facebook. Our artists use it all the time. Oh, I do too. I don't, I don't dislike and, uh, Facebook. <laughs> People love Facebook. You heard it here first. <laughs> to, to answer your initial question, if, you know, DIY, <laughs> if DIY startup artists, you know, can use these tools, absolutely for Facebook and cash, um, particularly for Facebook, you know, most of my bands are on Facebook as personal users, so they know how to upload photos, they know how to use it. Um, some of my bands don't even have computers, they do it all from their iPhones, and it's been extremely effective, and obviously, you know, people can post right as they have it, um, and we're connecting with real people, but also, you know, I love it when you guys integrate. So we did a campaign with Cash and Facebook where we released an exclusive Brennan Benson track using Cash's tools through Facebook. Um, so you could only get the song if you liked Brennan on Facebook. It tripled his numbers in a week. Um, so, you know, we do those things to build up these numbers and, and we have this community, but one thing that we struggle with, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is when we're creating invites for tours, we still can't get to those fans. So we've built up this fan base and I can't quite connect with them. So that's one of my questions. Um, we do sell music directly on Facebook through Nimbit. We've had a lot of success doing that. And uh, the other thing that we do is whenever we launch a tour, I get in touch with all the promoters and say, hey, can you guys throw down 50 bucks for Facebook ads? Um, I would love for Facebook to do that instead and be in touch with Golden Voice and Bowery and Live Nation and AEG and that's already taken care of. So I think that could be a cool thing for you guys to do. But 
I definitely want to be able to get in touch more directly with the fans who have publicly stated support for our artists, and I'm going to guess you guys would rather have us buy the ads, so maybe that's why, but again, maybe it, it, there's some way we could integrate that. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so, um, so your first question or your first part was about um, events and basically creating events. So, so I assume what's happening is basically that you create the event on Facebook, but then no one clicks on it or something like that. So I want to be able to get in touch with those 15,000 fans we gain through using Cash's tools. Gotcha. Okay. So, so I think Facebook ads are probably the best way to go about that. Um, but then also using the targeted, um, uh, we call it kind of like publisher privacy settings, so you can target by um, geography for that. Um, and you can basically speak directly to those, you know, But I, I still can't them. send them an invite to a tour or a show, correct? Correct. Correct. So, I mean, that's basically built off of, like, you know, a, as a privacy protection so that, that people aren't spammed. But they already signed up but, to support that artist. Um, they, they signed up to receive updates from that person in terms of um, receiving uh, things in their stream, but um, messages beyond that are sort of an extra special protection that we add in just what to if make we sure. give them cool things like music <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's definitely something that like you know we'll think about and and obviously like as I was saying in, in in my talk that you know we're really just at the beginning stages of a lot of things you know um, so I mean I think there's a really long way to go and and these things and these conversations are really important to us because we have to understand how it is people how musicians and how other people are using um, the tools that they have on their page, like, oh, our, you know, this event system isn't working for me, how can I better do that? Um, so, I mean, it, it, I think it's mostly just things that we need and to And I know you guys are always evolving and trying new things, so, awesome. I know, because I'm always confused when I go to the page and something changes. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, J Jesse? <laughs> Actually, I was just going to add, um, as an artist manager, <laughs> uh, as an artist manager, too, the, uh, you know, when you're, when you're putting in tour dates and doing all that stuff, I, I would love to see some of the stuff that, um, you know, like Soundkick does, where it's like, you know, here's, here's the next time someone's going to be near your city. Specifically targeted for them. If it was opt-in, that's great. But, you know, I, I end up sort of creating one and for another after another, art, you know, update yeah, yeah. for these things. And thank God the uh, couple of artists that I do manage um, don't tour a lot. So it's fine <laughs> for me. But Emily manages people that tour like crazy people. So I'm sure that... It's, it's a reputation problem. You know uh, Meredith is just going to go backstage and fix all this, so we're, yeah. we're all set. <laughs> yeah, we're, um, I, we're starting to talk about data a little bit. I want to look at the other side of data, and I want to get Eric uh, in the mix here. And I'm wondering if anybody on our reaction panel has anything to say about the type of metrics that we need to be looking at versus the type of metrics that are useful for artists and managers and the stuff that's just kind of extraneous and too much information. So I'll let any of you jump in there and, and feel free to uh, you know, start needling Eric. <laughs> um, SoundScan works against me because, you know... You can start there. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. Um, you know, it's like when we're doing deals for our artists, they may look at the last album sales, but they may not have looked at the fact that we just, you know, like I said, tripled Brendan's fans and things like that. So I guess my big thing is, like, I would love for all you guys to integrate like crazy. And, um, you know, I know Image and Heaps manager very well, and, and he told me a story about seeing that Jakarta was actually the number three country on Facebook, which it's obviously not a country. And, you know, you guys are obviously running into the challenge of bootlegging and, and trying to track sales there, which is a nightmare. But, you know, he took it to Imogen's booking agent and said, hey, you know, why don't you reach out to some promoters in Indonesia and, and see what's going on? She's getting the highest guarantees of her life there. So um, that's not a negative. Let me to just a quick comment on that in terms of... Uh, integrate, integrate. Sure, I can definitely do that. Is this going? In terms of SoundScan working against you, I think that's more how the people you're talking to are viewing the world. Correct. Right? It's not so much that our data is inaccurate, but as I said earlier, there's a lot of other activity out there, and the challenge for all of us is to work and to educate people that there's a lot of vibrancy in the market and they should look at multiple metrics. So it's not a SoundScan per se issue. I think it's just the industry is evolving. Totally. There's a new group of people out there who are taking a broader look at data and are placing their bets accordingly. So I would love for you to integrate with what Facebook and everybody else is doing. So when I'm, you know, meeting with business departments of labels and, and they're only looking at you guys because that's what they've done traditionally and they're not listening to what I have to say about the work we're doing with Jesse or the work we're doing with Facebook, I would just love for it to be all on the same and platform. That's, that's a little bit about what we're doing with, with the artist scorecard, which is take a broad look at all of that activity and have it in a single location. And, and look, we're, 
we're like a lot of other industries where we're, we're managing this evolution from being primarily physically based to being something which is very hybrid and uh, you know we want to tie it together. I think that there's a need for simplicity in all of this. Can, 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 oh, go ahead. I appreciate that you are. Can you talk about the business model behind the artist's scorecard? Because traditionally, SoundScan's been out of the reach yeah, for, exactly. for the majority of independent let artists me, and let probably me just managers. Kind of preface this by saying I'm, I'm a little new to it. I've got another guy in the audience who's new here. There's some new faces for, for SoundScan, and we recognize that. And that's part of the reason we're at an event like this. Um, we want our data to be accessible. And um, we recognize that, uh, particularly in this market, what an independent musician can afford to pay versus what a major can afford to pay, there are leaps and bounds of differences. So all I can say on this one is, is talk to us. Let us know what you're looking for. There's always a way of putting together packages which may be less comprehensive but can also get you what you need. We can always look to do broader deals with industry associations, with the coalition itself. We want people using our information. Get together with these guys. No. All, all together. Would you like to really yeah, capture your data? Sure. Hey, Rebecca Gates, how are you doing over there? I'm listening. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, you know, all of the information is really great, but I think, like, you know, at the end of the day, Jesse brought it up a little bit, and I think a lot of artists are concerned about how they're going to, you know, make a living. And I, I wanted to know how you feel. Like, any, any of these services, the ones that you've heard from and, and, the, and just out there in general, how does that work into your, your payday? Can you get a payday using any of these things? Um, I haven't. But, you know, I haven't well, also haven't put out a done. record for a long time. But at the okay. same time, so, I mean, there's, I'm, I, I'm constantly on reserve in terms of response because I haven't had an active record in the last couple of years. So that's when this culture has exploded. So at the same time, one of the things that I'm always, and, and the conversation is really helpful, the tools are amazing, the openness is amazing, the resources are amazing. At the same time, there's so much energy, there's so much energy going into all the metrics, all the data, all the advertising, all the marketing. That's great. Is it about music? Is it about sustaining artists' culture? Is it about sustaining, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just, whether this is appropriate comment for this panel or not, like one of the most, the things that gives me the most context and encouragement as an artist is the stuff that I'm hearing from NEA HUD and some of the government agencies who are like, how are we gonna, can, how are we, in a physical sense, in a sense of landscape, how are we actually going to encourage arts? How are we gonna keep sustainability? How are we gonna benefit our national culture, our global culture from arts? So it's like, that's something that's really encouraging to me, makes me excited to make work. And this is all really encouraging, but it feels really, it's like, so I don't ever want to have social media in my mind, and granted I'm of a certain generation, but I don't ever want to have it confused necessarily with, with making. There's like, you, some of the stuff that happens on, video, on YouTube is incredible. But to me, it's like, it's cutting edge video art. I'm a musician, I deal with sound. One of the reasons I say I'm persnickety is that I, as much as I love film, as much as I love video, as much as I know it's been a tool, and I love any, you know, I mean, anything from like old Johnny Cash video clips in the 40s on up, we love, it's inspirational. I mean, we go to YouTube to now to figure out how to play songs, mm -hmm. you know, when we're doing covers. Like, there's, it's a great tool. But for me, what's always been really special is voice, music in your body, music in a room, a community, a community of people, and it's that really... So I'm always kind of like, why are we always going... I also do sound art, I do audio editing, so I'm always like, why are we always talking about DVDs? We're always combining music with visuals. So there's an element of me with interacting with computers and with Facebooks and that kind of... I mean, any platform, the Facebooks, the face spaces, like Jill's mom <laughs> said, or space faces, I love that. But basically, I'm so, I always struggle with that, because I'm like, what is the translation? And it's a great tool, and it should be an aspect, it should be a facet of what I'm doing in terms of marketing my work as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. yes. Is it my work? No, video art is not my work. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, so I'm, I'm sort of trying to parse through a lot of stuff and I'm also, it's very easy to quantify a lot of this. It's easy to talk about data and it's easy to talk about like we've, and it's necessary and I actually find it really compelling. But at the same time, it's, it's, less, it's less easy to talk about things that are ineffable. It's a lot easy to say like what makes a band good, what makes a band bad. Yeah. So I think that I would like more energy put into art and into music and like what we're doing and how we can create that space to, to keep looking at those questions and maintain that stream and not just kind of keep making these closed circuits of like social media. So that's, yeah. I know I was just all over the place. So like, I, that's I guess, kind of my hit. Jesse Von Doom, how do we turn ones and zeros into soul? 
Once is your excuse. Uh, actually, before you answer that, I, I mean, Rebecca hit on something a little bit earlier that I think is really interesting as well, and it's something Future Music Coalition has been uh, asking ourselves, and that is, uh, can this technology aid sustainable local cultural communities? And, you know, money is certainly a part of that, but, you know, what are we building, and, and who is it uh, going to be useful for? Uh, can we actually return to a, a, you know, a place or get back to a place where music is valued in local communities and we have something you know, that grows you know, organically there? Jesse, can you, can you talk about that a little well, bit? Well, I don't know if I'm exactly talking about it. Um, or can you just say words <laughs> in sequence? I'll, just, I'll filibuster. It's what we do here, right? right. Um, <laughs> yesterday's panel in the morning, um, Chuck D started talking about the importance of, of local music and local music scenes and how um, you know, once upon a time, what you would do is you'd be the biggest artist in your tri-state area, your quad-state area, whatever you might be. Um, and then I believe it was Fred from uh, Google who brought up the idea saying, talked about Jonathan Colton, who uh, uh, also a board member of mine, so I should, another disclosure jam there. Um, Jonathan Colton built uh, a, a fierce following by going online, and he found where his fans were online. Uh, I think that artists need to recognize uh, who they connect with. They, um, you know, ideally they connect with someone in their backyard. It doesn't always happen that way. I'm, as someone that just moved cross country from Rhode Island to Portland, Oregon, just because I think my organization is better fit for Oregon, um, you know, it, it's the same for artists. You can find where your audience is, where your crowd is. If it is local, you should embrace them and love them and do everything you can on a regular basis to be physically with them and physically perform music with them. And if, if it turns out through the internet it's uh, Jakarta? Yes. Yes. Then go to Jakarta. I mean, uh, you know, find, find those people, connect them, and, and be with them directly. Also, you heard it here first. Go to Jakarta. <laughs> I hope you guys Hot tip. wrote that down. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think that the, the local community aspect of it, and also what HUD's done, what they've done down in, in Loyola in New Orleans, it's, it's fantastic. There, there are big grants and big money to sponsor um, uh, various educational programs around the music industry and to bring musicians and, and sort of entrepreneurial music, musicianship back to the community, and it's been a revitalizing force there, and there's no doubt about that. And just from the show last night, I think yeah. there are hangovers here to prove it. Yeah. yeah. Hangovers. Uh, um, I was sick last night, so I don't have a hangover. I just have a lingering head cold. Uh, same thing. Um, you know, the internet uh, it kind of feels one way. Local always seems to feel a little bit more authentic. And one thing that we're seeing with these services is, you know, they, they have a lot of useful aspects, uh, but some of them seem a little bit the same no matter what you're doing with them. And I want to, I don't want to uh, take anything away from the reaction panel. I'm wondering if the reaction panel has anything to say about authenticity, and if anybody here has anything to say about authenticity in terms of data, personal experience, or, or what have you. Just to clarify, when you said it all sounds well, I mean, like if I'm using uh, Facebook, for example, and, and I'm hitting up, you know, I have that page, that page is great, I have one, I, I use it. Um, I think kind of, look, the most, and it's, people talked about this yesterday, and I think the most important thing is regardless of the site, regardless of the distribution, it's the content, and it's, it's mm -hmm. the music that's out there. And I think what's unique about the people in this audience is they're putting out that content. And it's a fine line between everyone to focus on the data and focus on how to distribute it, but more importantly, particularly for the people in this audience, Put out the good music. Put out yeah. stuff that people want to hear, and then mm -hmm. the, the platform and the distribution That's is point. less. But then than again, anything. at the same time, you know, you can put out good music and still struggle with obscurity. So I mean, what? There's a gazillion musicians out there, and it's, it's challenging. So what we should should we do about that? Should we should I'll I'll, I'll quit playing music. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll volunteer. I would actually like to say that we we should. Um, yeah, I got a cheer for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> once again, playing the asshole. Um, I'd like to say that there's actually room for artists to fail commercially, and I think that that's okay. Um, I, I know it's, it sounds horrible, and it's not, I don't want that to happen, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that some artists are not necessarily going after a commercial dollar, or they're not trying to make their entire living off of their music, and that's a perfectly admirable and wonderful goal. You're making art. You should never feel like it's a failure, but I do think that, you know, it is, it is not necessarily realistic to expect that you put out a record, which you just did a fantastic record. You have a day job, right? I See? think. That's what I'm saying, a contributor. I'm standing right here. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, Geffen's calling, I'm sure. But, um, but yeah, you know, I think that it, it should be something that we admire, both culturally and, and um, 
uh, you know, just as people in general, the, the creation of this work, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it is, that it is transformed into a full-time professional musician either. So, you know, you talk about so many artists out there, and, you know, it's great to have your local favorites, but it's also okay to not necessarily build a giant career and instead make your art for you and for the, the people around you that, that love you and care about you and, and will support you to the degree they can. And to, to sort of accept that fact, it lets us start to acknowledge some of the artists who are building those careers and who are um, gaining the traction and getting the fans. The, think of the Portugal, man, Portugal the man of the world, you know, those types of bands. They, they go around and they get this huge gathering of people. They don't get mega famous, but they are, are working, touring musicians playing legitimate and authentic music to a crowd that they speak to in their own voice. We have a couple minutes left, and I know you have a couple of thoughts. One quick point on that is, if you look at a platform, you talk about the number of musicians. If you look at a platform like YouTube, there are thousands of people on that site making, making music and creating content. And it, that sort of reflects people in general and how they approach music. Like everybody's a musician, everybody sings at some point in their life, right? And, and everybody isn't going to make a living at it, right? But I think that certainly as a, as a technology provider and probably for you as well, what we want to think about is how do we make it so that enough people can make a living off of this? The people who dedicate it to themselves to it, right? And have audience and create audience can make a living off of that. And if you look at the question was how do you pay your mortgage? Mm -hmm. We have people on YouTube and YouTube is not how they've done it, right? But right. YouTube plus iTunes sales, plus merchandising, plus right. touring, right? The tools are there and they say, I've quit my day job. I'm a musician now and I bought mm -hmm. a house, right? And I started <laughs> online and I right. never toured, right? I never had a physical audience. And so mm -hmm. I think that, um, we're not there at the scale we want to be, but I think that in the last couple of years, we are seeing pieces fall into place where there is a future. Right? It's, it's not the past, right? right? And there won't be the superstars, but there's also not going to be 50 superstars. There's going to be hundreds. I actually have a question. Um, are you guys planning on uh, allowing artists to um, put uh, their own sales links on their pages? Uh, Last FM does and a few others do. So yeah, where, where we are today is we do have the click to buy links on some music content, yep. but, and this is just practical advice, if there's musicians in the audience and you're not in, a, you're not in the revenue sharing program and that's, that's not for you yet, put a link into wherever you're, put, put a bit.ly link in, mm -hmm. right? They're hugely popular, they drive tons of traffic. Um, Anton Dodson, the Bed Intruder song, mm -hmm. which went to, on to become a Billboard Top 100 hit. Never had, a, never had a click to buy link, right? Just put a link in the description and mm -hmm. sell it, right? Mm -hmm. why, why is uh, YouTube RepShare not available to everybody? Um, my business partner managed Liam Sullivan and Kelly Like Shoes and had a great RepShare thing with you guys going on and it was very successful for everybody. But we also managed Margaret Cho and, and we've been in touch with you guys about setting up RevShare and it, mm. it's not done. <laughs> And it's it's been over a year. If you've got, so it's been over. Who have you gone through the musicians <laughs> wanted sign up? I'll flow? start dropping names. <laughs> um, no, I mean I, I know what you guys are dealing with legally, and you know. No, it's not. It's not necessarily a question. So there's a there could be a legal issue involved, but more than uh, Margaret likely, owns all her rights. Also. Okay. Yeah. So more than likely, you should go through the musicians wanted flow. The response has been incredible. So how many how many people are accepted that apply? So if you meet if you if you meet certain thresholds, and those thresholds all usually are somewhat sustainable um, audience, right? Um, I don't actually have the percentage, but we've, we've accepted hundreds into the program and have a backlog of more than that to get through. So it's been very successful in what we're doing. Is the backlog based to establishing that they have the rights? Is no, the, back, you the backlog is, is just based on, re it's based on review, and so it's something we're scaling out. So we, somebody um, has to personally yeah. look at it. I think it. you guys need to settle this backstage. That's what yeah. I think. Um, so, no, but unfortunately, no, we can't come into the program. There's no, if you own your rights, you're not, you're not, not eligible to to get into the floor. We do unfortunately have to close this one down. This fantastic panel, I want to thank uh, our presenters and our panelists. And you guys.